This podcast episode is made possible by wowdigital.com, your trusted partner for nonprofit and charity website and design. Discover the game-changing strategies for managing and safeguarding your organization's reputation in times of crisis. Welcome to the Nonprofit Digital Success Podcast. Hi, I'm your host, David, and today we're diving into the critical world of crisis communications with John P. David. John's expertise in crisis communication encompasses a wide spectrum from managing media scrutiny, both earned and undeserved, to navigating sensitive situations like workplace violence in financial scams. His article has been published in HuffPost, PR Daily. He's also the author of How to Protect or Destroy Your Reputation Online. John, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think this is going to be a really great episode. We haven't really talked much on the show about reputation management, and I think this is going to be a really great conversation. So kicking off, how do you define what a communication crisis is? is. And isn't this something that really like big companies should be focusing on? I think crisis is relative. It depends on the situation. So I always say, like, think about this. Let's say that you go to your burger joint, right? You know, national franchise, McDonald's, Burger King, one of these national, right? right? And something happens. A mouse runs across the floor. Now that's embarrassing for Burger King. And what may happen is that you may not go back to Burger King, that Burger King. You may tell your friends about what happened at the local Burger King, but it's not going to be a problem for the people in Burger King headquarters quarters for every one of their restaurants or for restaurants for, you know, in Seattle or Portland or New York or whatever, any other place in the other country of the world, right? But if you go to your local family owned bakery or deli and, you know, it's mom and pop and their shop and a mouse runs across the dining room, then you've got an existential crisis, right? So one's embarrassing, one's existential, same situation. It's just a matter of the circumstance of the type of organization. And so I think every organization should be prepared because you just never know when something could happen. A certain like bigger companies, they have larger issues. You know, airlines have larger issues. Companies that have large exposure to the public, you know, big retail stores, they have different levels of crisis. But smaller companies too should be thinking about it because you just never know when something will happen. And, and I was thinking about this earlier today as well is because we used to have back in the good old days from the generation that worked in an office all the time, it was easy to kind of grab everybody and pull them together, you know? So, so if something was going on, you'd say, we're having a staff meeting, you know, and then 20 minutes, we need everybody to meet in the conference room and you could say what's going on. And now you have people who are on different time zones, obviously different places. They might be down the street, but they're working remotely. And so it's just, just all different sorts of challenges. So I think every organization needs to be thinking about what can go wrong, what can happen. And when you do by your own fault or by happenstance, you get yourself into trouble. Yeah, I remember my wife and I, we were at a restaurant and she ordered a salad. Cool. No problem. We've been to this restaurant a bazillion times. Gets a salad. She's eating it. I'm eating whatever I was eating. And then she's like, is that a moth? There's a oh, moth gosh. in a salad. And we couldn't find a waiter or waitress or whatever. And so she took it and went to the back and saw where they were. Spoke to the manager. You'll never guess what came out of his mouth. I'm going to guess that he said, did you bring that in with you or you just do that on purpose or did you, is it your fault or is it, oh, I've been looking for my moss. Now that's where he ended No, he said, <laughs> not again. Oh, no, he's <laughs> not again. <laughs> oh no, not again. Not another moth. Right. Anyways, well, so goodness. that was like a good 10 years ago. Was that a big fatal thing? No, they're still around. They're still making money. Now, when I was working at the hospital, we had a massive emergency crisis plan. I think it's all relative to you, where you are, what you're doing, who you're serving. If you imagine a hospital, anybody that's first line crisis intervention, police, ambulance, fire, hospital, doctors, right? That can be really, really damaging. Somebody falls, they break a bone, they die, right? So it's really imperative to understand, I think, what the issues are that you could face and do some of that like what if game. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's room for that. I mean, I would say if I was to give you kind of like the layout, the playbook, do you have the basic communications information? Do you have a media policy for your employees? So they know what the rules are if someone reaches out to them from the outside, from a media outlet. And it's as simple as putting together a one page policy that says, here's what you do in case of media outreach. You know, and typically what that says is you're not a spokesperson for the company. You know, if someone calls you from a media outlet, treat them with the utmost respect, tell them you're not a spokesperson for the company. 
tell them how to reach a person who can answer their question. It's not your job to try to field the call or try to find an answer for them. It's your job to reach out and call someone higher up the chain. And if you have your own internal PR person, you'd call that person or they call the CEO or the owner or whoever it is, right? The head of the organization. But it's also good to have outside counsel to have them on there too, because so they're aware. And if you ask the question, and a lot of times the media outlets call and they have silly questions and they, their questions don't make sense and they're barking up a tree kind of thing. But the first thing is have that sort of policy in place. Something does turn the wrong way. You're at least aligned to try to deal with it versus having to like go on the fly or you find out, you know, the worst thing ever is that, you know, you all of a sudden there's a story online and they're quoting one of your employees. They're like, oh, why is that person in there? Are they in the story? And that's, they happen to be on the field. They happen to be at the event. They happen to be whatever. And they didn't know the rules of engagement because the media landscape has changed dramatically. There still are appropriate rules of engagement. So that's the first thing is like have that policy in place. That's as simple as putting something in your employee manual and yeah, maybe you have to get your lawyers to prove it or whatever, but something like that. And then the second is to make sure you have clear channels of communication to all your employees if something does go wrong. Like what I was getting at before, you know, you still just say, oh, okay, let's go in the conference room. We're going to say what's going on. Now you've got these, you know, remote workers all over the place and people working at different shifts and some people are coming on Thursdays and some people are coming on Fridays. So you have to have a way of, you know, make sure, and that might just be as simple as knowing how to send a company-wide email. Or if you're on one of these other platforms, which I don't know a whole heck of a lot about, but you know, there's other platforms out there that people can be on. There's that. And then the other kind of core thing is to identify who's going to speak, know who that person is, know if that's going to be the CEO or that's going to be the managing director or whoever that's going to be, or that's going to be the PR spokesperson, or that's going to be an outside consultant. Because sometimes it's easier for the outside person to deal with this crisis than it is for the internal person. The bulk of it is to think in terms of, okay, what are my vulnerabilities? You know, and most organizations, they know. It. They know where there might be an issue could arise. But in the nonprofit world, what I would be concerned about is, okay, I'm prepared if there's some type of fraud, for example, or like your organization gave money to somebody who really didn't deserve to get that money, right? That you got defrauded or something like that, you know, or there's like a rapid turnover in people, you know, all of a sudden the CEO leaves under strange circumstances, or even just the CEO's leaving and they want to make sure we know what we're talking about when he or she is going to be replaced. And then the other issue is about these. You know, you read about it in all these organizations and nonprofit organizations, they have money, right? You know, they raise money, they serve you money, but they also have money. And a lot of times there's malfeasance and people steal from the nonprofits. They steal from credit unions. Like I said, they work with credit unions. You know, employees do bad things. You know, they're not just because you're working for a nonprofit doesn't mean that you have a pristine reputation as an individual. And so you have to be prepared to sit there and say, okay, what would we do if something like this happened? And then you go and sort of game it out a little bit. Okay, we need to make sure we have a spokesperson. We need to make sure we want to have a message. And we want to make sure that our contacting all our board members, reaching all of our advisory council people, our are we on set up on a way to reach out to all of our vendors, you know, our donors or our targets? Because all of these things, if all of a sudden a nonprofit finds out that, you know, they gave whatever, $25,000 to somebody who used it to fly to Europe instead of what was supposed to be used for, then you've got a problem on your hands. You've got a whole young issue. Yeah. I mean, it could even be maybe not as big as that, but sure. Maybe there's a crazy snowstorm, ice storm, or heat wave, and you offer programs and services at your location, or you meet at a park. How can you connect with those people to tell them, hey, we've got some like inclement weather, by the way, this is going to be canceled today or this week or whatever it happens to be. You know, how can you do that? It's not crisis communications, although first thing that comes to mind is media and like something blowing up in the media, right? But I think there's also how do you handle things internally with your employees. Maybe you've sure. lost power at your facility and you need to get in touch with everybody so that they know not to come in that day or sure. whatever it happens to be. So I think there's lots of different variables. Yeah, no, absolutely. From an internal standpoint, you're hundred percent correct. That you have to be able to reach out and make sure that people understand, you know, listen, we're closed tomorrow because of the rain or the snow or the hurricane where I live kind of thing. It's a really good primer actually for, you know, the unexpected. I'm in South Florida and we have hurricanes, right? And there's Pretty set, pretty set rhythm to what happens when there's a hurricane approaching. First thing is, is that there's all of this media attention about the hurricane in advance, right? And then the National Hurricane Center has these levels of warnings, right? And it gets to this point where they call it hurricane warning. From there on in, everything is shut down. Hurricane warning means they're expecting the hurricane has a potential to hit you within two days. And that's when the whole town, you know, shuts down and buildings shut down. So you can't go into work. Even if you wanted to, the building's shutting down. That's when they're starting saying, don't go to work, don't be on the road, you know, get home. 
get your act together and all that stuff. But at the same time, you do want to communicate with all your employees and let them know this crisis plan, the snowstorm plan, the hurricane plan, whatever plan, and here's what you need to know. And then obviously you can sit there and say, oh, okay, well, we sent that email out and, you know, we got 15% of them bounced back. Well, that's no good. Or phone calls or whatever you're trying to do to reach your stakeholders. So those are all good kind of primers if something goes really sideways. Yeah, when I was at the hospital, one of the scenarios that we were in was what happens if there's bomb threat at another hospital and all people are diverted or there's an accident. We were right near a major highway. Everything's shut down and people can't get in. So there's lots of different preparedness, I guess, that we can be doing and thinking about. I think from the nonprofit space, catastrophic things like that are probably not really on the table, but, you know, not necessarily. Off. Sure. No, I, I would say, you know, again, it's sort of plan for the best, prepare for the worst sort of thing. And like I said, that it's all relative, meaning there's a big difference between, you know, workplace violence and there's like an embezzlement or some kind of financial issue. You know, those are vastly different. One could be existential and the other not. But I think if you prepare, you in other words, just have you lay the groundwork so that you're prepared in case something happens. That's really the big thing. And then a lot of times what happens is there's a lot of misinformation out there and misinformation that's old as time. You know, it's this is not a new thing. This is you know, people, you know, the old telephone game. You know, it's like there's something happens and all of a sudden it looks like it might be larger than it really is. And today with the sort of 24 hour news cycle and everybody has a video recorder in their hand, there's a lot of opportunity for things to get kind of turned around on you. So you have to be able to act quickly. And if you're dealing with the traditional media, you have to understand how they operate. And, you know, for me, I do crisis communications all the time. And a lot of times the end result is there's a reporter who's working on a story about a topic and the story goes away because we made it go away. Way. You know, we didn't make it go to way in a various way. We made it go away because we educated the reporter about what was actually happening. And that person who was, you know, whispering in their ear is not really telling the truth or story they got has a little bit of truth to it, but not 100% true. And what they're acting on is not necessarily accurate. Yeah, I kind of think of crisis comms plans as like insurance. Sure. You want to pay for insurance, hoping that you never need it. And you want to have a comms plan, a strategy. Back in the day, there was like a crisis comms binder, like a five inch thick binder. You don't need that anymore. It could be a series of Google Docs, spreadsheets, whatever it is, so that the people that are looking for the stuff, when something happens, that you've got it all documented and set aside there. So leading into that, what can companies do to prepare for a crisis? Well, I think aside from, you know, having that, the basic frameworks of a plan is to really look at what vulnerabilities are out there and to think about what would we do if this happened? Sometimes it's a little bit morbid or a little bit scarier. So maybe even it sounds a little bit silly, you know, but there's many scenarios that seem like they're completely far-fetched and then they actually end up happening. So I think trying to figure out what would happen for, you know, kind of white collar type of organization, I would look at the issues that impact white collar organizations. So it's going to be financial. What happens if there's a financial impropriety of some kind and there's data and privacy, you know, that what's if there is a hack and there's a leak or there's, you know, private information. And then the other one is what happens if something goes wrong from the human capital world? There's a lawsuit, there's harassment case, there's employee misconduct, you know, and then the extreme is, you know, what if workplace violence active shooter, all those things. And, you know, 15 years ago, there wasn't even a word for active shooter. You know, it happened. It was, we used to say, you know, somebody went postal, right? Because it always happened at the post office. But now it's like, it's part of the lexicon. And now they teach kids in school about what do you do? But I think like all these things, you just have to say, here's our sort of like worst case scenario. Here's what we should do. And then just laying it out. Oh, here's our primary spokesperson. If that person's not here, who's next and who's next in line? Who's going to approve any statements we give out? What's our stated policy? Is that we're going to communicate as best we can, make sure we know the phone numbers for the lawyers, make sure we know the numbers for the media outlets, having all those things prepared, you know, just having everything in one spot, you know, because it does happen. I represent a terrible organization that recently enacted one of its crisis communication plans that was at the outset of the Hamas attacks on Israel. You'd sit there and say, we're going to be in a situation where things are just on their ear. The potential's there, you know. It's like you have plenty of examples out there of, you know, the worst cases. I was just watching the uh, documentary about the Tour de France, and there was also on Netflix, they were showing the old ESPN 30 for 30 with Lance Armstrong. So imagine you were working at Livestrong, right? And then all of a sudden you find out that, guess what? Lance Armstrong just went on Oprah and said he cheated, right? So things can happen. And again, I don't mean to be sort of like the doomsday guy. It's not my personality, but bad things can happen. 
Yeah, and it's sad and unfortunate when it does happen, but we need to also know what to do in those situations. And I think if you're listening to this, right, you could probably sit down, do some brainstorming, like what are some of these things? But I think it's important to reach out to somebody that does this. You go, hey, are we on the right path with this? What else should we be thinking of? Should we be thinking like Hollywood production? What could, you know, a writer imagine and come up with that could potentially affect us? You can certainly leverage AI to do some brainstorming storming around that give it like a really awesome prompt like this is our organization this is what we do here's who we are here's who we serve we want to put together a crisis comms plan what should we be thinking of and leverage it for that way but actually building out the plan having it all documented that's going to take time it's not going to happen overnight Right. The good news is it's not something that you have to develop you know, in 10 minutes and spend some time doing it. I mean, obviously, you want to have something that's available and have the basics ready to go. I had a friend of mine who was in the jewelry store. First time I met him, he had a small space in an office building. And I said, well, this is secure up here. He goes, yeah, it's secure. But he goes, because I could think of 20 ways in which somebody could rob me blind, you know. And ironically, he moved it down to the street level and he was next to a bank of all things. And the bad guys attempted to rob his jewelry store by ripping out the ATM machine in the bank and go up, trying to get into his jewelry store. Crazy as that sounds. But the thing is that you have business people and people who run organizations, it's their job to understand where the vulnerabilities are. And so they know what their big issues are. And if they don't know, you can sort of, like I said, you can have those conversations and figure it out. Now, the advantage, I can drift into the like the plugging area of the conversation, and not just for me personally, but just in general, the value of having an outside consultant whose objective can help you with the planning, right? Can say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Things that maybe the internal people wouldn't be comfortable talking about. An outside person can deal with the media in other ways. I represent companies and I call and I speak to reporters all the time and they're ready to go. They want to go and write this, you know, they think they're going to, they got the next Watergate, right? On their hands. You know, as an outside person, I can have a candid conversation with them where the ground rules are set, where it's like, listen, I'm not a spokesperson for this organization. I know you called them. I'm calling you. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm trying to answer your questions. I'm here to help you, you know, help me help you. Right. And that's really hard for an internal person. It's very hard for them to call up a reporter and say, I don't know what's going on, you know? So it's much easier for an outside person to be your liaison when dealing particularly with the traditional media. But at the same time, as you're probably going to tell me next, is that, ask me next, is that it goes from, there's a lot more happening now than just the traditional media, because obviously you have, you know, anybody with a cell phone has a video camera in it. You have video bloggers, you have just people who have their own Instagram channel and they're publishing whatever they want to publish. And so it gets trickier, you know, people create their own little media outlet and they don't necessarily follow the traditional rules. That's another issue um, that you have to deal with. So you have to realize that this may not break kind of the way you think it's going to break. You have to really be prepared that even if you game it out the best you can, it's going to take some twists and turns you weren't prepared for. Yeah. Further to that, I think it's important for organizations if you don't have any Google alerts set up to create some Google alerts. It's free. Put your brand name in there, your organization, things like that, so that you can get emails if you're mentioned. Because to your point, anybody and everybody can publish whatever they want. True, false, doesn't matter. They can go and do what they want. I think it's important for organizations to just be aware of what's out there. Maybe it's, a, okay, this person, they have like three people following them on X or Twitter or wherever. We can kind of like ignore this, but just kind of keep our eye on it. We'll check back in a couple of days versus that this is a mega issue. We're getting like coverage by CNN, like what is going on? How do we handle right. this type of thing, right? So there's very astute point. of it, but I think there's also the severity, two different things that may or may not exist at the same time. Yeah, no, that's a valuable point. You know, with this, you know, microphone that everybody has, everyone's microphone is not creative equal, right? So you're right. There's sometimes you have somebody saying something crazy, you know, and like you said, they have 100 followers on Twitter. And you look at that and go, this guy's got 100 followers on Twitter and he's not speaking with anything substantial. I'm not really going to worry about it. But in some major influencer who has, um, you know, a million followers retweets it, then you've got an issue potentially on your hands. And that's true. And then listen, a lot of times something happens and it's bad, but it's, it's it feels worse on the inside than it looks from the outside. And that happens on occasion. I had a client that was mentioned in a documentary film and there was you know, not a flattering portrayal of this company. And when they first heard about it, they were livid. They were like, this is besmirching our brand and everything else. You know, it's like the director is going to go all around the country and play this documentary and it's going to be in film festivals and it's going to be everywhere. And we're going to have to deal with this for the next two years. And I said, you know, wait, let's just slow down for a second. Let's sort of figure out what's going on here. This film has been in the works. Do we 
know this was coming out? How did this, all of a sudden, this is a huge problem? How did we not know about this? And then what it ended up turning out to be is that it was a much smaller deal. It was not as big of a story. The film actually had been out for six months. It hadn't gotten any traction. The story was the whole arc, and I'm the jaded PR guy talking about my client, but I felt like the, the arc of the whole documentary made no sense, you know? And so whenever we were talking to somebody, you know, we would say, listen, their whole thesis it doesn't make sense. And so there was a massive panic for a couple of days, and then everybody calmed down because it just wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. But you should still keep an eye on it because you never know when something could go viral, as we say. So what can companies, organizations, businesses do to develop plans and protocols to engage with media, influencers, stakeholders during a crisis? Are there any best practices or platforms that you would suggest? Well, I think that the first thing is if you're not on the social media platforms, you should be. Because if something does happen and you want to comment on it, you know, it's much better coming from your official Twitter slash X account or your official Facebook page or your official Instagram account. You know, you're able to actually communicate. So I think it's important that if you're still one of those companies that says, I don't believe in all this stuff. Here's just another reason why you should have it. You don't have to sit there and spend a ton of time on it, but you should at least have the appropriate accounts so you can actually communicate. Because you're right, all your audience, they're not all on your email list, right? And they're not all on the same social channels and everyone's getting information in different ways. There was a time when we were getting lots of information from broadcast TV and then it was cable TV. And now, you know, nobody watches live TV anymore except for whatever sports and like breaking news. And, you know, people are getting their news from their phones and TikTok and Instagram and things like that. So I think it's important to be prepared that if you need to communicate something that you should be able to be prepared to use the social channels it might mean being prepared to do some sponsored posts and do some paid posts that will help you get the reach that you're required to have, you know, in today's world. Because, you know, obviously one tweet is just one tweet. I think there's also a level of transparency that you need to figure out what's right for your business. I don't think that you should be out there saying, oh, this didn't happen because at some point somebody, like you said, is going to have video of something that actually did happen and it's going to refute whatever you're claiming. So be honest and transparent. And I think that's also going to build a bigger level of trust with your constituents, your donors, your supporters, whoever it happens to be. And look, yes, this did happen. Here's what we did. Here's how we went about rectifying, fixing, remediating, firing. We can't talk about this because it's an active police investigation, like things like that really helped build trust, right? Yeah, and no, I think that you're violent isn't always the right play for sure. You're 100% correct. You don't want to be at the no comment organization, but you can be the organization that says we're addressing these complaints and we're talking to our legal counsel or we're dealing with this internally and we don't have anything further to tell you other than that. But that's what we're doing and we're being with our people and our stakeholders and we're working to remedy the situation. And, you know, it's then almost every situation that's going to be better than, you know, we couldn't reach them for comment. And the other thing is that you don't want to just be a no comment type of organization because that's the way you'll be forever, meaning that the media won't even reach out to you the next time. They're not expecting anything to happen and you want to keep those channels open because if something does turn, you want to be able to have a regular conversation with someone. I think what a lot of folks don't understand when it dealing with, again, like the traditional media is that you can talk to them. You don't have to tell them everything that's going on. You don't even have to give them anything that they can use, but you can have a conversation and say, okay, this happened, something bad happened. We're not going to talk about it. It involves a minor, right? It involves a very private situation. It involved this. So we don't have a comment on it. So you can say no comment, but I'm telling you, it's not because we don't want to talk about it. It's because it's not appropriate for us to talk about it. That goes a lot further than just, yeah, well, we have no comment, you know? Yeah. And to that point, media are constantly looking for experts on things. If you have a relationship where you're open, you're honest, you're transparent, you can't talk about it because X, Y, Z, they might come to you for a totally different reason that'll show positive light on your organization or yourself or whatever you're doing, because there's something else happening in the media that's like a good story of some kind. And they want your opinion, your thoughts, your leadership around whatever that happens to be. And so you shouldn't just write it off because I think there's other pieces that can come to fruition from it. Will it always happen? No. Maybe one in a million chance, one in a thousand. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. It's your 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 point is well made because there's no downside to having a positive relationship with another person in business or in the media or anything. There's no downside to that. Is it likely that they're gonna you know whatever someone's from NBC Nightly News who's sticking a camera in your face over something that they're gonna want to come back next week and talk about your ice cream social? Probably not. But it's better to have a positive interaction than a negative one. And again, that's how you build relationships, particularly locally. I think if you deal with local media. John, this has been awesome conversation, super insightful. I've got some stuff to take back to my team and okay, chat great. about what we need to <laughs> do in my agency. <laughs> and also, you know, have some conversations with some of our clients as well around, hey, have you thought about this? So thank you so much for your advice and your thoughts and your leadership around this and in terms of managing communications crises or other bigger things that do happen. So I'm curious, if anybody wants to connect with you, if they want some help, some support, ask you some questions, what do they need to do? Sure. My website is davidpr.com and I'm easy to connect with. So I'm always open to talking to folks. I mean, the part of what happens in crisis is that, you know, there's like a triage phase and you know, what's exactly going on. And I'm always open to help people out. If I can't help them, I'll try to point them in the right direction as best I can. So that, I mean, that's the first place to go is to my website, davidpr.com. And there's several different ways of reaching out and connecting with me there. So no affiliation. Yes, I'm a David, but I am not David PR. John is David <laughs> PR .com. Look, if all you do is get John's contact info and put it in your virtual Rolodex, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit by saying that, right? <laughs> put it in your contacts in case you do need some support at some time. I think that's a win for sure right there. John, thanks again for being here on the Nonprofit Digital Success Podcast. Everybody listening, if you want links to anything that we've talked about or to review the transcript we've posted up on our show notes page. Just head over to nonprofitdigitalsuccess.com. Click on this episode for all the details. And until next time, keep on being successful.